So good morning once again. It's good to be here after quite some time. And uh, before we can get into preaching or to hearing what God preached to us, allow me to say that um, I am thankful to God for His faithfulness. We began walking through the book of Ephesians sometime early in this year, and today is marking the last portion of this particular uh, book. That's what we shall be focusing on today from verse 18 all the way to verses 24. I want to take this opportunity to really appreciate God for His faithfulness and grace and also for those that have stood here to proclaim the word of God. We have had several of our preachers, and I really want to appreciate that everyone made every effort to be faithful to the text. Uh, not all time, but in different times, I get to eavesdrop uh, by getting into the, the Facebook page and also to get to watch the sermons that have been preached. And I really want to thank God for the commitment of the preachers to the Word of God. May the Lord bless them. This morning, um, as we have read, we are going to be focusing on Ephesians chapter 6. Maybe before I get to preach, allow me to say that for the sake of those that probably we've never met, I am Joel Njayu. My name is Joel Njayu. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of my life. I am one of the pastors in this church. Aida has read for us, but I want to request that I read it again, that we may hear it again, so that even as we get to hear it being preached, uh, it's already clear in our minds, and it will be easier to follow the direction as we follow also. Uh, the progression that the Apostle placed the inspiration within the text. So, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, I will not ask you to stand, but just follow me. I know it's kind of right in the middle of a sentence, but I'll be starting from verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, <coughs> so that you may also know how I am and what I am doing Teaching us the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Verse 23. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. And that is the word of the Lord. Amen. So, we have been walking through the book of Ephesians and God through his apostle has given us a panoramic view of the life of the believer from eternity past into the present and even into the eternity future that we were in the mind of God before time began. Those who are in Christ Jesus, God knew each one of us. God chose us. God uh, decided that we shall be in relationship with Him. However, we know that when time began, man fell into sin, and sin separated us from God, and we have been forever uh, we have been separated from God 
as long as we are outside of Christ. But God in his wisdom knew that. It did not come to him as a surprise. He had planned the way that we will be reconciled to him and in a way that we will never be separated from him. And that was through the person of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ has been prophesied from as far as the Old Testament. If you remember when Jesus was walking to a house, he spoke to those two disciples, teaching them all the way from Moses and the prophets, you know, making us sweep through the scriptures, showing them the things concerning Christ. God had already planned and prepared that Christ must come and must suffer. But that was in essence uh, the price that was paid for our ransom. Today, we stand justified, we stand in a perfect relationship with God, not because of our own doing, but because of the grace and the mercies of God. So the Apostle took us through that very um, a deep doctrinal truth, and then we were able to come to chapter 4, where we saw that having seen who we are positionally, in Christ, we are supposed to live out our faith in our day-to-day -day walk. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, we are called to live in a manner worthy of the calling with which we have been called. And in a very practical way, we have been walking in terms of being shown how we are supposed to live as children of the light walking and living in righteousness and how also we relate with one another in marriage in our families that is between husband and wife and then between parents and children in the workplaces i know within this context it was a context where slavery was flourishing but bringing it to our time it has to do with our work relationships and that means that our faith must be lived out. we must uh, uh, we must not only profess what we believe, but we must live out what we believe, because the transformation has begun from outside, but it has to be lived out. And, and, and that was beautiful as we walk through that in a very practical way. Every day, I believe the Spirit of God kept on challenging us in various areas of our lives. As I studied this scripture, I could see the many areas that I need to do adjustments and I desperately trusted the Lord because it's not by power, it's not by might, it's by the enablement of the Spirit of God. And so there has been a transformation of the journey and we thank God. And then I think uh, a few weeks ago we began walking through a spiritual warfare that yes, we are in this world but we are not of this world. In this world has a real enemy and we are engaged in a real battle. It's not a rehash. Uh, and so, we are highly opposed, vehemently opposed. The enemy does not want to see our progress. In fact, his desire is not only to be read, to be read us, to be there, but it is that our faith may be shipped. And so he makes every effort but I want to thank God that he has provided for the weaponry with the which we are to engage. We have walked through the armor uh, that we are to put on. As I was looking at that armor, I saw it's like there is a transition in verse 16. There is that which must remain to be on constantly. There is that which we take, we take on. So the belt of truth must be continually a continual part of a soul, a uh, breastplate of righteousness, the, the shoes indicative of not only, and it talks about the shoes uh, of the gospel of peace, but that is also indicative of we are to live our lifestyle, our shoes, our feet, our walk talks about our daily life as a Christian. We are to live within uh, that context, a crystal-centric, crystal-centered and focused kind of life. 
And then we are to take on the shield of faith, uh, sword of the spirit, and we are to engage. So today we come to verse 18. In verse 18, some people look at verse 18 uh, a prayer as part of the spiritual armor that the believer is supposed to have. <coughs> but I know, I know there is how they will argue that it is part of the spiritual armor. It is, it's, not, it's not a wrong way of looking at things, but I think for me, I will give out that. I would say that prayer, because if you look, let me just backtrack a little, a little bit. If you look at all the armor that is described, from the belt, the, uh, the breastplate, to the shoes, to the helmet, to the, to the shield, he is illustrating with a picture of a Roman soldier. And everything that he has described has a correlation of the particular issue that is within that arm. So when he's talking about the helmet of salvation, there is, there is something that is within the soldier's armor that he wants to use to illustrate a certain aspect of this Christian living that we are supposed to engage in that is, uh, that is, that is uh, our armor in the warfare. But when you look at prayer, he does not identify the equivalent piece of armor. Some people may say that um, the knees are not covered and so probably that is where now the prayer comes in. But I just want to say this. My conviction is that the believer is supposed to engage in warfare uh, within this context. We are not supposed to engage independently, but in communion with our God. We are only effective. We can only be able to withstand the opposition of the enemy to the extent that we are dependent on God. Independence makes you very vulnerable. The enemy that we are facing is a real enemy. The Bible calls him that old serpent. When you look at the casualties, everyone has been a casualty at one point or the other of the wiles and the strategies of the enemy. So there is no way that independently you can be able to counter this kind of opposition. We must be in communion with God. And so here at Bali, we are called to live within that context. And so this morning, we are looking at this topic that we are saying we are being called to prayer as we are concluding this particular book. So, let's look at uh, a few things. I, I really struggled in terms of how do I get to subdivide my points, but I think when you look at from verse 18, we can be able to see that there is a call to prayer, and within that call, the instructions uh, are to pray. There are several instructions, and we are going to be looking at Quite a number of them, especially verse 18, has about four aspects therein. And then uh, we also see the people that we are to pray for. People that we are to pray for, it's part of that instruction. And then we also get to see the Apostle Paul as he gives the benediction to the believers in Ephesus and beyond. We also find prayer. So that, I, I, I didn't want to call it a, 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 a demonstration or a model because that is not what he intends. But we get also to have kind of um, a peek into someone praying and eavesdropping there. And this will be informing us of a number of things. So as we are looking at prayer, before we can even get to verse 18, let me say that prayer is very, very important. And I've said that a Christian is supposed to, be, to live his life or her life in prayer. 
For us to be able to see the importance of prayer, I think we do not need to go far. But by looking at our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who was the very God of the very God, the Son of God, and yet we see that he prayed. He lived a lifestyle of prayer. How we engage in prayer helps us to see the importance. Let me just quickly quote a few verses. In the book of uh, Luke chapter 5, verses 16, verse 16, sorry. The Bible says that Jesus withdrew to desolate places and prayed. Let me just read it verbatim. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Chapter 6, verse 12. This is what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. In those days, in his days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. I want you to think of who is praying all night. This is Jesus Christ. The perfect express image of God. He continued all night in prayer. Then maybe we can also read Matthew chapter uh, Matthew chapter 14. Is it chapter, chapter 14? Yes, verse 23. This is what the Bible says about Christ. Maybe you can start from verse 22. The Bible says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. What is Jesus doing here? He is creating space to be alone. What, why is it important for him to be alone? Verse 23 tells us. He sent the disciples away. He sent the crowds away. And verse 23 says, And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. <coughs> and when evening came, he was there alone. So we see that Jesus prioritized prayer. And I think that can be a good conclusion to this particular section when we are talking about how important prayer is. The Apostle Paul himself uh, also, when we look at his life, we also get to see that the way he looked at life, the way he, I mean at prayer, the way he prioritized prayer, helps us to see that prayer was also important in his own life. He challenges the believers to pray at all times. I think we have just read that in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Is it in the book of Colossians? Yes, Colossians chapter 4, verses 2. The Bible says he is writing to the Colossians and he is telling them, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So we see that he is instructing different Christian groups to pray. In my book, I have, in, in, my, in my house, I have a, a, a book that is a devotional book, and it's about the prayers in the Bible. It has gone through the entire Bible and picked up uh, every place where there is prayer, and so it has a few expositional uh, notes about that particular section of prayer. And as I was studying this text this week, I noted that when you look at the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, there is no one letter from Romans to all the way to the book of Philemon or Philemon. There is no book that Paul has not talked about prayer, prayed, or called the Christians to pray. And so we also see that even the apostles, in as much as today we may look at them from a vantage point by looking at their life and admire them, and some of us maybe sometimes even wishing that we could be them or we could have what they had or the privilege they had, we see that they, they, they had such a dependence on God. They prayed. They knew the importance of communion with God. So this morning as we look at the importance of prayer, the question that we need to ask ourselves also is how is our prayer life? Do we regard prayer in the same, with, with the same importance as Christ and as all the men of God in the Bible are valued or prioritized prayer. 
When was the last time that you set time aside to pray? If you want to see how, how have you prioritized prayer? I know many times maybe we pray when we are eating or just before we sleep. But do you have within your schedule, just like we have seen Christ sending away the disciples, sending away the crowds that he may create time to be alone. Do you have that discipline and even to create time and to dedicate yourself to prayer? Because it is important. Is prayer a labor or a delight? My prayer this morning is that we can see how important it is. And I think I need to clarify here, when I'm talking about prayer, many people may look at prayer as um, I've interacted with Christians and sometimes I feel like they have missed on prayer when they say it happened because of prayer, it cannot happen because of prayer, and so they have detached prayer from God and they have looked at prayer as though it is the one that is working. I want to say that prayer is a means, but God is the one who does it. Prayer is our heart expressing our dependence and uh, our faith and trust in God. And so I want you to see, when I'm talking about prayer, I'm not just talking about that kind of prayer that people pray and so check, and that means that when it happens, it is because I did. You need to see that through prayer, it was only but a means that you commune with God. God is the one who does it. So, as we look at the importance of prayer, look at how the apostle calls the Ephesians to be engaging in it. Number one, he talks about the frequency. He says, praying at all times. So praying at all times means that if it is something that must be engaged continually at all times, then it's very important. When you look at the things that you need in life, there are those things that you must constantly have. You cannot do a few minutes without air. Actually, you cannot do even for a moment without oxygen in your system. And so, you need it constantly. When we see that we are to pray at all times, it means that the believer was called into a relationship with God and we are to live in communion with God continually. Here we are told to pray at all times. The second thing that I want you to see is that we are being told to pray at all times in the Spirit. This is a scripture, or rather this is a statement that many times have been a challenge for people to understand as confused people. And I think the reason why is because of some words that Paul said in a corrective chapter as he was writing to the Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, let me just see. It's part First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will also, but I will sing with my mind also. So, that particular portion of text makes people, some people believe and feel and think that praying in the spirit is something separate and different other than the kind of prayer that we pray. Some people have gone all the way to an extent of saying that praying in the spirit is when we speak in tongues. I don't know whether you have ever come across such a statement. Uh, Jude also uh, used the same phrase. Jude is one chapter and in verse is it verse, verse 19? Verse 21. Sorry, verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. So we are told to pray at all times and we are told to pray in the Spirit. And the question has to do with what does it mean? 
This just clarifies the point that I was trying to make. That in as much as prayer is a priority and we need to engage in it, there is something that is called praying the Spirit, and I think in in retrospect or in converse, there is also praying in the flesh. So what does it mean to pray in the Spirit? My conviction is that praying the Spirit is when our prayers are led of the Holy Spirit. We are taught through Scripture by the Holy Spirit. Our prayers that are energized by the Holy Spirit. Just think with me. And I'm saying this as I answer those people who think that it is speaking in tongues because I will pray with my in the spirit and I will also pray with my mind. What the apostle is saying is that he does not bypass his mind in prayer. The mind is engaged, but it is guided and directed in order of the Holy Spirit. I just want you to think about Acts chapter 2, where the Bible says, and on the day when the day of Pentecost was fully come, uh, there was like the sound of a rushing mighty wind, and then on top of them, it seemed like as though there were tongues of fire. And they all spoke in different languages. And the Bible says, as the Spirit gave them enablement. So even that first day of Pentecost, what they were doing, they were doing that enabled of the Spirit. Is it possible that people can repeat that action not enabled by the Spirit? I say yes. I think we see it every day. Even some churches you go and you are taught what to repeat and what to say and that is called in those churches speaking in tongues. It is not of the Holy Spirit. It is praying in the flesh. Praying in the Spirit. You can actually be praying like the way I'm speaking but you are praying in the Spirit because the Spirit of God, you, you are scripturally praying. You are informed scripturally. You are um, are desperate for God to use you and to guide you and to direct you and to instruct. And this is what we are called to do. Are we together? I hope that point is understood. So, we are told to pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer. Here comes, not only, we have not only looked at the importance, the frequency, but we are told that there are variations. All prayer. I don't know how we can be able to qualify that, but all prayer, I look at it in terms of, number one, we can have both private prayer and public prayer. And I think Jesus talked about when you pray, go into your closet. That is private prayer. The same chapter I've just read, First Corinthians chapter 14, Paul is saying when you pray, if you pray in an unknown language, how will people say amen? And that means he was expecting that there will be times when prayers will be made public and by all of us saying amen, we are agreeing with the person who is praying. In essence, what I'm saying is that there is also a place for public. <coughs> and we need to engage in all, all these kinds of prayer, all these kinds of prayer. So number one, there is both public and private. And then number two, there is also all these variations. It's a kind of prayer that we call uh, the prayer of adoration, prayer of thanksgiving, uh, a prayer of repentance. We are being told that we need to be praying at all times. And that means that there will always, there will always be different needs at every given time. There will be times when you will be overwhelmed by the goodness of God and what you will be doing is to just feel a sense of just wanting to thank the Lord. You, 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 you admire your God. You express your heart's admiration to Him in adoration, in worship. All these things we are supposed to engage. And you realize that when you engage in all these aspects of prayer, actually, prayer becomes a lifestyle, not a tragedy. It's not something that we should be struggling in. So, as a believer... As much as you are living as a Christian, you need to engage in prayer at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. And then he says, to that end, 
que falar e não sabermos. So we have seen a call to prayer. And we have seen within that call to prayer, the importance of prayer, how we have to engage in it, in terms of frequency and in terms of its variation. So let's move to the second point of who <coughs> becomes part of our prayer ideas. And I think this is also a form of prayer that we call, just realized, I'm following on time. There's, there's a form of prayer that we call the prayer of intercession where we are praying for others. Uh, verse 18, the last portion says, making supplication for all the saints. So number one, it is expected of us that we pray for all the saints. Within a local church like this, it is your responsibility to pray for your brother and your sister. When you see people struggling, when you see people going through various, you know, challenges of life, our quick temptation is to discuss about it, but prayer is God, God is telling us through his word, we are to pray for them. You see that? So we are to pray for one another. I was just thinking about when we are called to pray, and I just realized how powerful this is. Have you ever realized that, 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 that if, you are, if, you are, if you have some tension with your brother, it is also challenging to pray for them and especially for their welfare. But if your relationship is doing well, you will find that it is easy and sometimes you can spend a long time, especially if they are struggling and they are your great friends, you can have, uh, you can take time to pray and actually you can commit yourself to it. Now, if we are to pray for all brothers, then I see that God is also calling us to see the need for uh, having sound and flowing relationships. We need to be quickly forgiving. Now we go back to the practical aspects that we began in chapter 4. Let me just read a text that is in chapter 4, verses, uh, verses 2. Verse two. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. How can that happen? You find that prayer becomes one of the means to achieve that. So, some of the differences we have is because we have not taken time to pray. I've realized that uh, one of the things that prayer does in my life is that there are times when I will go to pray and probably I have some things. I used to keep a prayer journal and I would have things that I'm praying for. I still do, but it's a discipline I need to have my game on. And sometimes I would be going with that prayer list, but as I begin to pray, I would find myself shifting. Either the Spirit of God pointing in my heart and in my life some of the areas that I'm falling short, and instead of now lifting these prayer items, I'll find myself repenting. So prayer becomes a means also of sanctification. God reminding me His Word and helping me to align it. So, we are told to pray for all saints. Secondly, we are not only to pray for all saints, but we are also to pray specifically for our preachers. Paul says, uh, pray for all saints and also for me. And I'm saying for our preachers, why? Because of what he says after that statement. He says, pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. So Paul is praying, is, is asking the believers to pray for him in this particular area of preaching. And I have realized as a preacher that it is very easy for you to fall into experience. 
When you go to school and you are taught how to exit a text and to prepare someone, it's very easy for you to just move from your desk and to go on preaching, and that can become a habit. But we are supposed, I think it was um, the late B.B. Warfield who was asked by a student of his whether he should, uh, he should, uh, what he was asking the percentages of times that he should use in prayer and in preparation of the sermon. And it was like, should I prepare for these hours and then pray for these hours? And the professor had this face of like confusion based on the question that was asked. How do you prepare and then you pray? You are supposed to be praying as you prepare. The two should be part and parcel of the Paul knows the importance of God using him to declare the word of God. One, you need to declare it boldly. When you preach the word of God in its integrity and in, in its totality and without withholding, you are not going to be pleasing to some people. And they are going to oppose you. And the opposition can be tough. But we need to declare it boldly, as clearly, because we are ambassadors. We are mouthpieces. We are simply communicating that which has been delivered to us. If you remember, in the Old Testament, there was a time that God called Samuel. You remember that the, was it the four times that he called Samuel, Samuel? And when Samuel responded, Samuel was given a message concerning the house of Eli. And it was a very scaring message that Samuel did not know how to communicate this message to his uh, his mentor, his father, Eddie. And he, he had to he had to withhold himself. He had he kept it to himself until Eli asked him, when the Lord spoke to you last night, what was the message? And I believe Eli could perceive that this boy has a heavy message. He doesn't want to speak it, he doesn't have the boldness because of the weight of the message. And he told him, if you do not say it, then may it be with you. And I think that threat opened Samuel to speak. We too need God's grace and God's strength to be able to deliver the message of God. You need to pray for your preachers. Are we together? So Paul says, pray for me. So pray for boldness. Then secondly, I want you to think here. Different people come to church, or rather, uh, congregants come to church, and they have gone through different experiences within the week. Whenever I'm coming here, I'm cognizant of the fact that there are people who are struggling in their walk with God. Some people are struggling in areas of righteousness. Others are struggling in the areas of the things of life, say for example, you are struggling in your finances, you are struggling in a job. Most of your parents there, as I preach to them, I know there are those who are struggling with a teenager who is already probably in drug addiction, and that puts everything else like it does not matter. There are those who are struggling with the grief. Many times when I've gone to a house of grief, I know that I can speak words and they can be as empty as empty can be. I still remember when I lost my father, I realized, and actually I had to go and pray, because there were people who were speaking, and they were speaking from sincerity, but the situation that you are in, you just don't, that word is not just landing on. And I also realized how I would have spoken empty words. And as much as I was speaking the word of God, it was not going through to this heart and to this mind to be able to point them to Christ. They are still lost in the confusion of, is God still? Is God still there? Is God still out? I still remember a place where I went and I had a, after I preached, I came and sat next to the man who was mourning his daughter. 
it would have been brutally murdered. I think you saw that story on the TV or on, on, on the newspaper. A husband using a knife over uh, killed the wife so brutally she was pregnant, she moves the baby. And here I am preaching. And then after I see the man asking me, Pastor, even if that man gets arrested, even if he gets killed in a mob justice, it will still not satisfy my heart. All I need is to see my body. But I can't see. I'm still wondering where I was born. So in those moments, you don't just want to speak the word, you want to speak the word means, you know, as a as a, as, as a helped by the Holy Spirit. Guided by the Holy Spirit. What are you to say? Which scripture are you going to read? So, pray for your preachers that they may be sensitive. Not all truths are to be spoken at all times. Still remember, a mother who had waited for 14 years in marriage without a baby, and then she gets a baby. And two weeks down the line, the baby is <coughs> Now, in as much as the sovereignty of God is a truth of scripture. Wisdom should inform you that yes, there is also something called time. And timing here is you better just be vulnerable as vulnerable can be and tell them you also do not understand but one thing you know is that you can never doubt the character of God even if the facts are same. There have been places that I've gone and I've seen God work in that way. What I'm saying is that Paul is praying. He's asking that the believers may pray for him. And I'm saying not only for Paul, but also for preachers who stand to declare the word of God, and they need to declare it with boldness. Verse 20 says, for which I am an ambassador. Paul is cognizant of the fact that it is not his message. He is speaking the message of his kingdom. One of the things that is required of an ambassador is to be faithful to the sending government. When he speaks, he does not speak as an individual. He speaks as an institution. Just like the way, if, for example, newsmen came into my office, you know, there is a difference between them coming to my home and they will say, we interviewed a man in the street or we interviewed a man in the estate, and this is what he said. When they come to the office and they are asking me a question about Kahawes Baptist Church, do you know what will feature tomorrow in the newspaper? The Church of Kahawes Baptist Church says. Because there are times when the position you're occupying is an institutional position. So when Paul is saying that I am an ambassador, he is he knows very well that we have a message from God and we need to be faithful to that message. Now, today I know you may not understand the weight of why, what it means to pray for your preachers to be faithful. But I still remember when uh, this militia group began, the Mungiki, you remember? I was in Yahuru and I met a young boy, or rather, not, not a young boy, but he was a man that we had been together in a certain primary school. And so, uh, I greet him, we exchange the pleasantries and the formalities. And then he asked me, what do you do? I told him, I preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And the words that he responded with me hit me back. He said, what are you telling us about that boy born and dead? You know, it can really come out nasty when it's being spoken in one actor. And I got angry because of the response. And so I decided to engage him. And as I engaged him, before knowing, I was just concentrating with this person, there was a crowd of over 50 men that, was a, that were around me. By that time, in Yamuru, that is a town where minor gender, the leader of the Mungiki, comes from just within me, near there. And all these were Mungiki people. And you know what they used to do? They would torture you all the way to the point of you recanting your faith. And um, 
at that moment, you need God's grace, you need God's strength, because human strength will not, will not do this. So to cut a long story short, uh, God gave me wisdom. And when I answered whatever questions I was being answered, because they were forcing me to become, to take the oath. And uh, I'm very fluent in Kikuyu, so I spoke to them in Kikuyu, and then I told them, by the way, has this Moro told you that I am not a Kikuyu? So as you are giving me a law, what clan am I going to become? And then I began to ask them questions in deep Kikuyu that made all of them say, by the way, you don't need to convert him because he doesn't belong to us. And they all left. But you need boldness. And there will be times when even your life will be your life. So Paul is saying, pray not only for the saints, but pray also for your teachers. And then Paul also wants you to pray specifically. So he tells you to pray for him as he preaches. And then he says that he is sending Tychicus, who will clarify he has two assignments. One is to clarify how we are doing. Paul has a team um, that he used to go with. There is Silas, there is Silas, there is Titus, there is Timothy. There are quite a number of people that he has. And he is telling them, Tichikas is going to come and clarify how we are doing. Maybe I can do it so that you may also know how I am and what I'm doing. Tichikas, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. He has just told you to pray for him as he tells you everything. Is it for entertainment? It's so that you may also be part of what he is doing. Be concerned, and as you are concerned, you're also praying, but you are now praying specifically in the areas that he is in. He has already said he's an ambassador in chains. He's already in prison. That is a whole concept altogether. He's going through torture and through a lot of opposition. And so as you are praying, you need to know how someone is good. You need to know how are they doing. Only in their spiritual life, but also in their welfare as a human being. So to pray specifically is very scriptural. It's very scriptural. Secondly, the other assignment, Paul says, not only that you may know how we are, but then in the last statement of verse 22 he says, and that he may encourage your hearts. That also tells you about the preacher's concern for the sheep. He is an ambassador in chains, but he is concerned about their welfare. And that, you know, cements the whole concept that the church of Jesus Christ must be characterized by love because love is what pushes our concern for one another. We are to love one another. And Tichikas is sent so that he can encourage them. Paul is concerned. We have seen in chapter 1, verse 15, in chapter 3, I believe, verse 15, saying, I now bend my knee, I pray for you. He has been in intercession for them. And now he goes an extra step. He wants not only them to have their, the eyes of their understanding, you know, lightened up. He not only wants them to be firm in their faith, but, and he does that through prayer. But now he sends one of the faithful ministers. So even the choice of who to send is very important. One of the faithful ministers. Look at the qualities of teachers. Faithful minister in the Lord. Uh, verse 21. Tichikas, the beloved brother faithful minister in the Lord. So the motivation of Tichikas is not to please, it's not just because he has been sent by God to please God, but he does that as unto the Lord. And he comes to encourage the hearts of this man. Look with me 
just two books ahead in Colossians chapter 4. I believe that Tychicus was sent because Paul knew he is going not only to represent him accurately, but he has a genuine concern. When Paul was writing to the Colossians, he tells them this in verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Jesus Christ, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has one heart for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. I'm just digressing to show you that Epaphras had a concern for the Colossian church. So Paul is sending him, he's telling them about him, he's telling them about how he has been sick. Now here in the book of Ephesians, we see him sending Tichikas, the beloved brother. I believe he had a concern for them. Do you see how these things are working? That we are not only supposed to engage in a lifeless kind of a Christianity, but it's a Christianity that is supposed also to be informed, or rather to inform even our relationships. <coughs> then let me rush quickly to the benediction. And it says, peace be to the brothers. Here, a benediction is like a wish. And when you look at this benediction, it is, seems almost to be a repetition. Or is like when he writes to other churches. There, seem, there seems to be some things that are similar. And when I was looking at that, what came into my mind is, I believe it is because our primary needs do not change. We have a primary need to be at peace with God. That has been established by Jesus Christ. As Paul is wishing them this, I believe it's not just what we call a wish, like have good luck, but it's actually a prayer expressed in word. He says, peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul has not only told them to pray for all saints, to pray for others, he is concerned with them, and he continues even to pray for the peace, the love. So he prays the love, peace be to the brothers, by the way, do you see that? I think I have missed on this. Uh, peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love in corrupt. Do you see that this prayer is exclusive for the believers? There are times, yes, we have been called to pray, like 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1, it says that all prayers and supplications are to be made for all people, especially those that are yeah, and that, and that are kings, and there we are talking about president, those in leadership, and all. But there is this prayer that we are told is exclusive. And as I come to a conclusion, that means that if you're in this church and you have no relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, there is still a circle that you have not entered. God is calling you to a relationship with Him. And for us who are in the faith, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just conclude with a few thoughts and then we shall be praying. Going through this particular text, we see that number one, we are being called to a lifestyle of prayer. So if that does not characterize your life, you know I've heard in some churches of people being called prayer warriors. When you look at today's scripture, what is it saying? All of us are supposed to be prayer warriors. If prayer warriors means people who pray all the time, or pray more, or pray, they have priorities prayer. So we are called to a lifestyle of prayer. Secondly, when we are told to intercede for others, we are being heightened to this concept that we need each other. Not needing as a way of, I cannot do without you, but needing in such a way that I need to be concerned with how you are doing. We have been brought together in this community. We belong to this community. Jesus, when he was praying in John chapter 17, verse 21, he said that we may be one, that they may be one, even as we are one, that the world may know, 
So this is a call to unity. The same thing that has been emphasized, I think when you are looking at uh, uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3, about how the wall of enmity was broken down between the Gentiles and the Jews, and the two have become one, a mystery hidden in the Old Testament. In the same way we see that as we come to a conclusion, where, when we are being called to pray for one another, it's actually a call for unity. We are just being told that we are supposed to pray specifically. That means I need to be engaged with your life, to know how you are doing, to call you when I don't see you in church, to actually rebuke you when I see you wavering in your walk with God. When I got saved, I was a member of the Kenya Assemblies of God. And I remember church discipline was one of the qualities that was was highly, you know, there was such serious church discipline. I remember one time I met with a girl that we had been in school together in primary school and now here I am in college. And so we meet and we begin talking. And as we are talking, some elders from the church come and find us talking. You know they stop there because they want to know and she's not born again by the so what are you saying? Someone who's not born. That is how strict things were during those days. The whole idea was that we need to be concerned that you need to call out to your brother and you need to help your brother and you realize that sometimes some of the things you speak in as much as they are truthful they will be resisted at that particular time but that person will be thankful to you later. So let's not do things for popularity.